Hello everyone and welcome to Drama TM, a place where we open take so hot they will hopefully rekindle the fire of this called Dead Channel. Also look at me, I'm like the love child of Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter, watch. My fathers will hear about this. I am actually pretty blind. Say hi. Hi. He's saying bye now. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. <laughs> Ah, I feel so weird. It's been so long since I've been in front of a camera and it's just weird. <laughs> anyway, today we're going to be talking about the Gaslight Gatekeep Girl Boss meme, I guess? Phenomenon? Phenomenon? But we're going to do it in style with the help of our dearly beloved, mostly queer coded Disney villains. Since Gaslight Gatekeep Go Boss is like a whole thing and also a mouthful, Gaslight Gatekeep Go Boss, Gaslight Gatekeep Go Boss, Gaslight Gatekeep Go Boss, we're going to start by defining the individual components of a phrase. Part 1 Gaslight. Gaslighting is a psychological term used to define a specific type of emotional abuse. It comes from the play Gaslight by Patrick Hamilton, in which a guy tries to convince his wife that she is insane by altering her perception of reality. For that, he uses tactics such as progressively dimming the lights of the house. And then he convinces her that everything is her fault, it's just her imagination, and she's overreacting. Fun. Gaslighting now is used to describe a specific type of manipulation in which a gaslighter ties the victim's sense of reality to them. Shut up. A gaslighter makes you doubt your memory, your perception, or even your mental health, with the objective of making you lose your own autonomy. For a case study, we've got mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, mother Gothel. Mother Gothel is an expert manipulator and also an absolute delight to watch on screen. It actually quite bothers me when you go see a movie and the movie paints this villain as this oh, so cool mastermind that has everyone wrapped around the little finger. And then you actually see them on screen and they're like a potato with the charisma of a wet rag. But enough thirsting. One of the reasons Mother Gothel is so effective as a character is that she is a really good gaslighter. I mean, just her song at the beginning would qualify as Gaslighting 101 in any reputable university. She starts by telling Rapunzel it's all for her own good, really, and establishing herself as her only caretaker, the only person in the world that she can rely on. You know why we stay up in this tower? I know that's right, to keep you safe and sound. Also, she doesn't deny Rapunzel's wishes right away, which would lead to direct confrontation. Instead, she says, Soon, but not yet, but shh, trust me, pet. And when Rapunzel is reasonably upset at this, she shifts the blame to the child. Stop no more, you'll just upset me. You are upsetting me. You are going to abandon me, your poor mother. I am so nice for putting up with you. Others wouldn't be so nice. Sloppy, underdressed, immature, clumsy, please, they'll eat you up alive! However, the tactic just wouldn't be complete without attacking the victim's self-worth a little more. Plus, I believe, getting kinda chubby. You're not ready for the dangers of the world. You're inadequate. You're absolutely dumb and inadequate. Always with her best interest at heart, of course. <sighs> I love you very much, dear. Throughout the movie and right until the end, Gothel doesn't physically restrain Rapunzel. She doesn't really need to. The tower serves as a device to isolate her, but not to contain her. She could always leave, like she had the means to do that. If I were to be trapped in that tower, like I could never, but her? Definitely. But if things would have continued as they were, she would have never left. Even in her last song at the end, the reprise of Mother Knows Best. Gothel doesn't take Rapunzel by the ear and takes her to the tower again. Instead, she makes her doubt the only real connection she's made in her life. Like a healthy person. So if he's such a dreamboat, go and put him to the test! Because no gaslighter ever has benefited from an outsider perspective. They need you to be alone. They need you to cut your ties to all the people that could make you doubt the version of reality that they bottle fed you. This is why he's here. Don't let him deceive you. But why? Well, in the movie it's basically so Gothel can keep using the magic flower of eternal juice that is now Rapunzel's hair or something. But it's actually not that far away from reality. I mean it is, like, objectively. 
my hair's not magical, just blonde. But they do it to control you. Maybe not your magical hair, but yes, the whole you. They do it so they can keep you putting all of your energy and effort into them. But why do I know? It's not as if I were going to graduate psychology anytime soon. Anyway, now that we have a bit of an understanding of what gaslighting is, let's move into the next component. Part 2. Gatekeeping. When we talk about gatekeeping, we need to do it in two different levels. According to Urban Dictionary, gatekeeping is what happens when someone takes it upon themselves to decide who does or doesn't have access or rights to a community or identity. And I think that's a pretty good definition. We all know that person. Yes, that person. The one with which conversations always go something like this. Hey, have you seen the new Barbie movie? <laughs> the new one? Why bother? If you were a real fan, you'd know that the new ones are trash. Or even, hey, I'm non-binary. <laughs> non-binary? Stop trying so hard to be queer. You know, that person. Gatekeeping on an individual level happens when the gatekeeper puts moral value into their fandoms, identities, or I don't know, even the right way to cook pasta. They put themselves and their toys atop a very high tower with a sign that reads, you shall not pass unless you are worthy. But like, who died and gave you that tower? Seriously, I need to know, I need a tower too. But what happens when you extrapolate this mechanism to, let's say, mass media? Or politics? Or even morality? Well, what it usually happens is that you get a bunch of rich white dudes deciding who gets to exist or who doesn't. And since we're on the topic of rich white guys, let's introduce our case study for this section. Mr. Claude Frollo himself. You know I'm so much purer than the common, vulgar, weak, licentious crowd. My guy Frollo is the absolute king of gatekeeping. Don't get me wrong, he's also pretty good at gaslighting and like two steps short of a girl boss. But for the context of this video, we're gonna stick to the first one. Frollo is an interesting character because the thing whose gates he's keeping is morality itself. Well, that in the city of Paris, I guess. The dude has a bit of a St. Peter's complex, am I right? It's a biblical joke. You wouldn't get it. Problem is, the entry criteria for morality is pretty arbitrary with that guy. Quasimodo can't be moral, because he's like really ugly. You are deformed. I am deformed. And you are ugly. And I am ugly. And these are crimes for which the world shows little pity. Esmeralda can't be moral, because he's got the hearts for her. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame. It is the gypsy girl, the witch who set this flame. And the gypsies can't be moral or Parisian because they've got too much melanin and they dance and they come from the devil's land. The gypsies live outside the normal order. Their heathen ways inflame the people's lowest instincts and they must be stopped. In the end, the only person that's cool enough to sit on his high horse is pretty much Frollo himself, like not even the Cardinal of Notre Dame. You can't sit with us! Sorry, I find this way more amusing than I should. <laughs> Besides, Frollo plays in both axes axes of gatekeeping. He keeps the outside world from Quasimodo in a very personal way. Out there they'll revile you as a monster. I am a monster. And since he's a very powerful man that controls half of Paris, he also gatekeeps the city from everyone that he doesn't see as a true fan of his Christian family values. And now that we're besties with not one, but two child abusers, let's jump into the next component of the phrase, shall we? Part 3. Girl boss. So this one's a little trickier, mostly because it hasn't been around for that long. Girl boss is a term popularized by Sofia Amoroso in her 2014 book of the same name. It is used to refer to a woman whose success is defined in opposition to the masculine business world in which she swims upstream. And like, that sounds well enough. We all know women have it tough, especially in male-dominated spaces like corporate jobs. However, I can't help but think that the girl boss rhetoric that Sophia proposes is kind of like the female equivalent to the garage entrepreneur. Garage entrepreneur. I can't say those words. <laughs> it's a sort of be your own boss, failure is your imagination, success story narrative about making it in this patriarchal capitalist hellscape without actually addressing any of it. Girl bosses and boss babes have sadly become another tool of the very system they swim upstream in. Little caveat, I'm obviously not talking about every woman that has 
ever been successful. I'm talking about the all-womanly CEOs, the multi-level marketing queens, the feminist icons of externalizing production to Bangladesh. But you know, they do it wearing a pin that says the future is female, so it's all good. Girl bossing is intrinsically tied with liberal feminism, which is sad, because we actually do need more diversity in positions of power, thank you very much. What we don't need is for them to pull the same crap that the Jeffrey Bezoses of this world have been pulling for ages. Like, maybe it's just me, but if I'm going to be exploited and discriminated against anyway, why the hell would I care that the exploiter in question is a girl? Things are always easier to understand with an example, and for this section, I've got not one, not two, okay, maybe, maybe it's two. Exhibit A, Cruella de Vil. I'm developing huge migraines, so we're gonna try to finish this quickly. This very stylish lady is the epitome of girl boxing. She's a very successful woman of business, an absolute entrepreneur. She could have been an example for little girls everywhere, if not for the fact that she likes to skin puppies alive. She's got a designer coat firm, faithful lackeys that take the fall for her when the authorities get involved, and a designer she exploits. There are always brilliant ideas I always steal. Seriously, if Dalmatian's vacation is anything to go by, the first time she gives her employee vacation time, it's a work vacation, and she manages to insert herself into it. She's the whole package. Vacation. Time taken off from employment for recreation. <laughs> Often followed immediately by termination. Unless you take the reimagining of the last movie as an example, in which case she is an amazing queen that did nothing wrong. Oh my god, stop slay. <laughs> I actually haven't watched that movie. I just watched the Amanda the Jedi video on it. <laughs> Maybe that should be my plan for the night. Exhibit B. Ursula. I was on the fence about including Ursula because she's obviously a lower class trans witch and Ariel is like the princess of the sea so you go honey suck those royals dry but I guess I cannot condone her bad actions and soul stealing. Morals are so uncomfortable. This deliciously queer coated villain is here because I have the firm belief that if she were alive right now she'd be running an MLM. <laughs> What's my channel? What's my life? <laughs> She would definitely sell you 20 boxes of essential oils in the span of an hour. Two days with her and you'd be blocked in all your family's phones and DMing every single girl you met in high school. They come flocking to my cauldron crying spells, Ursula, please, and I help them. Yes, I do. Besides, like any good boss babe, she does not hesitate in using the status quo of gender roles when it plays in her favor. However, she frees herself from the responsibility of doing so by saying things like, no, no, this is, this is not what I think, but this is what they think. The men up there don't like a lot of blabber. They think a girl who gossips is a bore. But in the end, she's just stealing from another woman to empower herself and get her own goals. Part 4. Final thoughts. I love this meme. In all its iterations. It's just... Peak comedy. <laughs> peak comedy. But why is it so funny, though? Because we humans love to laugh at the face of trouble. Irony and sarcasm are like the best thing that's ever happened to mental health. That was a joke. Go to therapy. Memes like this one reflect the sad truth. Capitalism will absorb anything it sees as marketable. From the Communist Manifesto, now available on Amazon, to Pride, aka Rainbow Month. Feminism was not going to escape that trend. And I mean, having marginalized people and like, powerful women be seen as marketable, it's not entirely bad. I don't know, it's better than being burned at the stake, I guess. But we still have a long, long way to go. And there's a difference between being normalized and being commodified. We should not forget that the gates are still well kept. The same companies that make t-shirts with feminist symbols have no measures to protect them from workplace harassment. The same companies that light up in rainbows every June have not hired a single trans person in the last 10 years. There's a very specific type of marginalized person that's allowed into the pantheon, and that's the one that will help uphold its values. And on that note, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been a long time coming, I hadn't posted in a while, and I really missed you guys, and I really missed doing things, and god, it's nice to, like, it's been weird to be in front of a camera again, but I like it. It's, it's fun. It's fun.
I hadn't posted in a while and I don't know, I'm excited. So please let me know what you think in the comments about the format, about the video itself. Just fight me. I don't know, do whatever. Thanks a million to my lovely patrons that literally just paid for my car to get fixed when it broke down the other month. So you're saving my life <laughs> and I owed you one. So... <sighs> Anyway, I'm super tired, so I'm gonna go. I hope you have a fantastic day and I love you and bye-bye.